or, and if, if we don't get completely through, and you, you've got a lot of slides to uh, use as reference. So um, kind of cutting right to it, um, uh, you know, I think most people are, are aware of this. And oh, by the way, Zoom talks for me are really hard because I'm a pacer and a hand talker. So I'm doing this a lot to the screen. So just bear with me. Um, and by the way, anybody want to, and I know it's harder on Zoom and it's less likely to happen, but if you have questions midstream, jump in, ask them, you know, use the chat box. Uh, Jen, Jen, Jennifer will uh, interrupt me. So don't, please don't hesitate to do that because once we get by something, it might be a ways before you get a chance to, to ask questions. Um, so anyway, four, four main categories of intellectual property, I think everybody's pretty familiar with, you know, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. Uh, you know, patents are obviously the inventions, that, that the high tech stuff that you're, that you're working on, um, uh, ornamental designs in the case of design patents, trademarks are, you know, logos, branding, all that material, copyright, is, you know, works of art uh, or works of authorship, more specific, more precisely, you know, that's, you know, books, paintings, software code, uh, things like that, and trade secrets, a, a bit of the kind of the redheaded step, stepchild when it comes to IP. Because uh, it doesn't really have a registration regime at all. It's um, you, you you gain trade secret protection by keeping it secret. Um, so we're, I'm not going to get into much about trade secret. Uh, if people have questions about it, I'm happy to talk about it. But mainly we're going to go through patent, trademark, copyright, um, and try to answer uh, 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 you know, what they are, how they work, uh, how you get them, and, and all that stuff. Um, so. Patents are the first one. We're gonna we're gonna kind of go in order here. Uh, so, so what what is it you really get when you when you when you uh, apply for a patent and eventually get get one issued to you? Um, I don't necessarily need to read read the uh, section language there, but you're you're granted you know the patentee is granted um, the, the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling the invention in the United States. Or importing the invention into the United States. I think that the I think the first set of uh, of uh, rights are pretty well known or understood. The importation part is something that maybe people forget about, and it it comes up when people are th considering whether or not to file foreign for, for foreign protection because that importation in a lot of cases provides a little bit of uh, foreign protection in some sense. If you're in, if you're uh, you know manufacturing all your stuff in China, for example. But your market is completely in the United States. Your U.S. patent is probably enough because you can stop things from coming in, coming in from China, uh, at, our, at our at the U.S. border. So it's something to, to keep in keep in mind. Um, but more more practically, why why do people actually get them? Uh, you know, these are these are high level um, soft answers. But you know, based on the last slide, it establishes some sort of moat or uh, monopoly. We don't really call it a monopoly because it's not. An, an actual one, but it's it, you know provides some sort of uh, buffer between between you and your competitors' um, ability to operate your space. Now that isn't all that practical if you're talking about startups or spinouts or anything like that, it, that, because it takes a lot of money to go into federal court and enforce your trademark or your patent. Where I think it comes in more more effectively or more quickly is this concept of using it as a defensive tool, and, and I always use that you know like that's. To me, that's the Cold War era version of patent law, where you you build up a patent portfolio, your competitors probably build up a patent portfolio, and you all, you both know it. You you know what your competitors are doing, and you just kind of choose not to sue each other. You 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 just kind of have a standoff, and you you let you everybody lives to fight another day, um, and that 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 is pretty effective, and that it's more effective when the the, the parties involved are kind of an equal equal footing. You know, if I'm if I'm a startup with two employees and Google has patents and I have patents, that model doesn't help a lot. Um, but it does help with other startups. And as you grow, it helps you with respect to other companies that are similar in size. Uh, you know, but but again, just really, really practically speaking, not even thinking about the, the patent law and how it operates. The, the bottom line is, for whatever reason, and there are reasons I'll explain them. Investors just prefer them. If you're if you're if you're in the startup world and you need money from an investor, one of the first questions they ask is, do you have any IP? And more specifically, if you're in the tech, a tech space, they're asking, do you have patents or at least patent applications? And, and the reasons they, they, they ask that question are for the reasons I just said. They, they, they know that it provides you yeah, limited monopoly and that defensive uh, uh, ability. Now, 
the other point here about the whole limited monopoly part and your right of exclusion, you're not, you're not getting a patent for your, if you're a startup, you're not getting a patent for your current self because of that, you know, inability to go wage, a, you know, as, as a seven figure uh, federal litigation um, uh, endeavor. But you are getting it for your future self, either your future self as you grow or your future self as you're acquired. Um, you, you, if you're acquired by Google, they can definitely use your, your patent portfolio and you become more valuable as your patent, patent portfolio grows. So a lot of this stuff is stuff that seems kind of obvious to people, I think, once you say it. And it, it, it kind of is. But there are some people who take this position that patents aren't valuable and just cutting through all the BS. The bottom line is in order to be invested in or purchased, you need to have IP or, or put another way, I guess more fairly, it increases your chances of those things happening. All right. So that's, that's why generally I, I you know, take the position that patents are, are, are a good thing. Um, now, these next two slides are kind of out of place and they're out of place because I never know where to put them because these are like the most two most important slides in the entire entire slide deck. And I logically, they kind of flow to go to the end <laughs> or kind of in the middle and they get lost and people tune it out. If you if you just ignore, ignore me for the entire hour and just capture these two two slides, that's, that's I've accomplished something. So we're gonna go through these quick, um, but logically speaking, they are kind of in the right place, at least at some level, because I'm talking about things before you go into the patent process, things that can ruin your ability to get a patent. Um, and so we want to make sure your, your rights aren't torched right off the bat so, so that you can have a, a fruitful uh, patenting effort. So the, the first point here is, you know, there are a number of things that can happen that can really kind of muck with your, your ability to get a patent. Self-barring events, meaning things that you can do that actually uh, ruin your, your ability. And I, and I have a list of those things on the next slide. Okay, so that we don't want to do those things. Uh, one other point here is inventors own rights, kind of in nature. If you invent something, well, not nature, but the, the state of the law, uh, when you invent something, you're the, you're the natural owner of that, of that patent. Um, so to deal with that, if you're a startup and you employ people and they're inventing things, you need to make sure you have assignment documents in place. And those, those come in two places. One is the employment agreement itself or partnership agreement. You want to make sure your partners are assigning rights to the right place too. Uh, an employment agreement though will have some sort of, well, it should have some sort of uh, uh, section that talks about how invention rights are owned by the company. Uh, and then on top of that, when you actually do and go ahead and file that patent application, you will, you'll sign a, a specific assignment document or the inventor will that assigns those rights in that specific patent number, patent application number to the company. So it's kind of double, double layer, generally speaking at kind of the employment agreement level. And then specifically when you file the application, you file a specific document. Now, and a lot of people who have been through this a little bit have you know, had experience with that. Uh, people who have patented before have, have, have had some experience with that, that specific assignment document. Now, the flip side of that coin is if you're a startup uh, person and you're working, you know, a day job and that day job is maybe somewhat related to the field that you're wanting to work in, uh, you need to make sure that anything you invent while employed with your employer isn't owned by your employer. Um, so if you're if you're in a, 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 a field that is similar to what your employer is doing, you need to really, really think about it and have a conversation with probably your attorney and and potentially your employer. A lot of employers or decent employers, you know, to, to the extent they know that you're not actually using, you know, company resources to do this, they'll usually supply what's called a waiver. Um, and it's, it's usually pretty harmless. They, you know, are pretty, pretty easy or painless to get. Um, but you, you basically go to their general counsel or whoever their decision maker is. They don't have general counsel. You know, you know, I'm starting this new company. Um, no, I don't want to compete with you. I'm not using your resources. Basically, they'll give you a little letter that 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 waives their rights any inventions that might come about uh, from your activity. Um, and then the final point is just sounds incredibly self-serving, but it's not really meant to be. It's because of all these issues, you really should talk to a patent attorney as soon as you can. As soon as you start down this road of you know whether you're starting up as a startup or you've been a startup for a, or you've been a company for a while and now all of a sudden you have some new technology you think you need to protect because of all these little potholes that exist before you even get going, 
you know, I would reach out to whoever, whatever patent attorney you prefer and have some of these conversations. And most, most patent attorneys will have these conversations with you up front to at least walk you through some of these problems. Um, and so I, I would not hesitate to go and reach out to somebody and, and make the, have those conversations early, you know, way before, you know, well in advance of, of, of putting a lot of money down in either the, the technology development or the, the startup effort, all of that, because if things don't go right in, in, on a couple of these bullet points, you could have your, your ability to actually capture anything could be pretty low. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, here's kind of a laundry list of things you should not do before getting a patent application on file. So these are what we call the self-barring events, you know, public disclosure, um, and that really should be public, or that should really be printed publication, but public disclosure, public use, and offer for sale. Um, you know, kind of, they are what they sound like, but but public disclosure uh, or, or written publication, printed publication, or, or things like websites, uh, pitches, for example, uh, a startup pitch, which are really kind of all, all the, all the uh, rave right now, um, conferences, academic conferences, uh, trade shows, things like that. Grant applications in some cases can actually be considered a, a, a public disclosure. Um, public use is uh, generally what it sounds like, but there are some exceptions. I think the biggest thing is, is the biggest example, the easiest example is in a, if you're a software company or, or an e-commerce company, and you're providing some, you know, uh, uh, software as a service uh, product. You know, your code and all that is, is hidden. It's 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 behind closed doors. The public doesn't know about it. They don't know how your machine learning algorithm is working, for example. Well, that that doesn't mean it's not public use. It's it's not publicly, you know, it's not publicly available. It's but this is what I would call secret public use. So that but that's something that can actually bar you from getting a patent because it's being used in a way. That it's intended. You would never go and disclose that information publicly, um, but the, the end product, the end parts of it that are accessible to the consumer are out in public, and that's something to be aware of. That's that's something that trips people up quite a bit. Um, I don't know how many times I've had people, you know, bring this up six months into it, and they, oh well, you know, yeah, we're using the product, but nobody knows how it works, so we we, we keep all that hidden. That that doesn't really help you. That that's a that, that can be a problem. And then offers for sale, um, uh, you, you sell the product or offer it for sale, that's a potential barring event. Um, now, I want to be clear, I'm talking about the product, not the company. It, this doesn't stop you from going and getting investment dollars, uh, anything like that. This is, this is the product. Uh, and, and the threshold for offering for sale is to me, I mean, it's a little bit uh, squishy, but usually a price. If you, have a, if you have a dollar amount in mind or you're or you're negotiating a dollar amount that that's offering for sale. Um, good news is there's a one year grace period in the US. Uh, it's, it's not completely hashed out yet because uh, this one year grace period went into effect with the AIA, which was an amendment to the, the, the patent law in the US. It took place in 2012. Um, that it, I think most patent attorneys would talk to you and if you would talk to them, they would say, yeah, you have a grace period of some form, we don't quite know exactly how it applies and the way, you know, courts are, they're gonna interpret it and they'll do something that's weird and it may not con completely read out the way you think it would in a statute. So while it exists, we don't necessarily wanna rely on it. It's more of a, a fail safe. General point is get something on file before any of these things happen. Um, if you come to my office or somebody comes to my office, they say, hey, we started selling these two months ago We'll say, okay, good news, bad news. You, you blew by the, the filing date, okay, but you have this one year grace period. In the US, you're probably okay. Okay, so we'll get the US taken care of. The reason it's it's a bigger problem, you know, beyond what it, knowing what the US rule is, is for, most foreign countries don't have this grace period. And all the foreign applications rely on a US, usually use, rely on a US filing date. They don't care that you, the US has a grace period. So your ability to get patents in say China or Europe or Canada are going to be really impacted by you going out and doing one of you know one, one of the you know, public disclosure use or offer for sale um, prior to a filing date. So so it can torch your your foreign rights pretty significantly. So so that's that. That's my warning red label slides. Um, don't forget these things. Now with that, we're going to kind of go back and actually go through the patent law and you know standards and and, and uh, different options here. So. 
So taking a step back, uh, the U.S. Um, has has three three uh, patent types of patent: uh, utility, design, and plant patent. Um, plant patent we're going to dispose of right away. I mean, if someone here is working in you know new varieties of plants, speak up, um, and, and we can talk about them. But if you're not, then they really serve no purpose to, to the crowd here. So, but they but they protect asexually reproduced distinct and variety of plants. So if you ever work in that field, know that there are plant patents out there that exist. But the, you know the main ones are utility patent and design patent. Utility patent is kind of the holy grail of patent law in the U.S. That's that's the patent that you're probably most familiar with. Um, protects new and non-obvious machine processes, article manufacture, and compositions of matter, which sounds kind of like about everything, which is, for the most part, kind of is. Um, now, the other type of patent, which is is making kind of a comeback, they used to be used quite a bit back in the day, and then they, they kind of fell out of popularity, and are, are making a comeback to, due to some changes in, in the law, are design patents, which, which protect uh, the ornamental design for an article of manufacture. Now, couple of examples of what I'm talking about and the way they operate differently and why it's important. So here's an example cover sheet and an example claim of, uh, of patents. And one thing to keep in mind and is, is patents are defined by claims. They're not defined by the, well, utility patents are not defined by drawings. They're, they're defined by claims. They're not defined by the title. They're not defined by the abstract. Sometimes people get hung up on that. They pick up a patent application, they're reading the title. And it feels like the, the invention is super broad. Well, that's because they're reading the title. And, and they, they tend to focus on the wrong part of the patent. Claims are what define your rights. They're kind of like the plat map in real estate. And that claim is this, this uh, you know, here, here's an example of one claim. You've got a lot of gobbledygook in there, a lot of legalese, um, probably a little bit, you know, hard to, to, to read at times. And it's sometimes hard for a patent lawyer to read. But that's what defines this, this uh, client's rights, okay? Um, so, so keep that in mind. And then contrast that to a design application where they still have claims. We still call them design claims, but the, the claims are actually defined by drawings. It's actually the, the drawing of the design which defines what claims they own. Now, the way this is modulated is you can use solid lines to define your claim subject matter and dotted lines to, to show unclaimed subject matter. So that allows you to kind of go in and, you know, in certain designs, you can't really see it with the one I have, that was a bad example to use, but you can go in and use certain you know, dotted lines for certain lines, things that are kind of common to the industry and really focus in on the patentable stuff using solid lines and really actually get pretty good scope or a broader, broader protection than you might think of than just looking at the drawing itself, right? So it's actually pretty, pretty nice to, to, to have. And these designs usually go through pretty easily. Um, they are interpreted more narrowly, but with kind of, with that use of those dotted lines, you can get broader protection than you would expect. Um, and the other reason designs are nice is infringement analysis is easier. It's, it's a pretty, pretty simple test. It's, it's basically, you, you look at the design in, in, the, in, the, in the patent, and then you look at the product. So if it's a water bottle, you're looking at the, at the water bottle of an infringer, a potential infringer. And then you basically ask um, through the eyes of an ordinary observer, um, are they the same? Are, you know, if I'm an ordinary observer, not, not a person skilled in the art, like just, just somebody off the street, do I look at this device and I, do I look at that design and do I think those things are the same? That's, that's the test. And that's an easy test. Um, and the way, the reason these have been coming, making a comeback is these have been really leveraged in kind of non-judicial enforcement channels. And by that, I mean things like Amazon, Etsy, eBay, uh, those type of companies, you know, they, they worry about IP and they worry about, you know, IP infringement happening on their platform. Well, one of the things that happens is, is design patent infringement. And if you have a nice design patent, it's kind of easy for, you know, a, 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 a employee at Amazon to pick up your design patent, look at it, and then look at this competitor that you've turned into Amazon, and then make a comparison. And, uh, you know, it, obviously, it's not judicial, you're not getting any sort of um, damages reward, but you can force them to take down that competing product. And, you know, that competing product can get back on, but they have to go through some steps to prove that they're not infringing. And so what you've done is shifted the burden to that other side, and in a really, really, really cost effective way. Um, you know, versus taking that and going and trying to enforce it in uh, federal court, which is 
obviously much more expensive, which is still an option. But for, for smaller companies, these design patents are pretty nice. You know, it depends on what technology you're in. If you're, if you're into AI um, and, and selling AI uh, services to the Department of Defense, this probably isn't useful to you. That you're going to be looking at utility patent, but this is this is one one industry point. So, with that, that's kind of all I'll talk about design patents. The rest will be more focused on utility patents. So, I want to go into a little bit of detail on on designs. But uh, you know, taking taking you through the patent process really quickly, uh, and this is something I think most people have at least a feeling for. The conception of the invention. That's just the invention process. Is the invention disclosure is you know just getting the information from your head to, to somebody else's head that's going to do something with it like whether it's a patent attorney whether it's in-house counsel if you're at a company um what have you then from there we would typically run a patent search then from there it's a uh, in most cases for small companies it's going to be a provisional application then the non-provisional application from there it goes into examination and then eventually that that patent will grant and I, i'm going to talk about each one of these steps so i'm I'm not glazing over things. We'll get into these in a bit. So that's that's a general layout. And that's a general flow. Um, so with the invention disclosure form or invention disclosure, we actually use something called an invention disclosure form, which, uh, you know, not that people love filling out forms, but this is like a nice, like systematic way of harvesting IP within your company. And, you know, maybe maybe at a startup level, it, it's a, it's it might feel a little over heavy, heavy handed, but it beyond just the administration part of it and, and keeping track of things, it's really a nice tool just to guide you through what you need to provide to actually get into the patent application. And the general point is any, whatever form you're using, whether it's mine or, 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 or John Doe's in New York, you're, you're kind of answering the same questions. You're, you're, you're identifying the problem that you're actually trying to solve with your invention. You're describing your invention, of course, which is the obvious point. But beyond just describing your invention as you've contemplated it, you also you also need to take a step back and spend some time about thinking about um, alternatives to your invention. So put your shoes in the, in in the you know put your feet in the shoes of your competitor. If they see your patent application as you've contemplated it, just as what you initially described as the invention, what would they do? What would they what would their alternative be to kind of work around what you're doing? And then let's capture those at, the, at your filing in, in your filing so that you kind of cut off some of those workarounds uh, in your patent. Um, and then, of course, drawings, you know, schematic drawings. If you're working in kind of a mechanical space um, or circuitry space, uh, flow diagrams, block diagrams, those types of things. If you're working in uh, software, the more material you can provide in that way, the better. And, you know, CAD drawings are great. Uh, wireframes are great if you're working, if you have a software app that, you know, going from screen to screen. Um, and then finally, it's, it's a good place. And this is why I say it if for no other reason. The other reasons are good too. But for no other reason, this is, a, this is a good place to keep track of prior art. And that's something that's important because if you know about prior art, you need to actually disclose that to the patent office when you eventually file your non-provisional. The problem is that could be a year, year and a half later, and who knows where that prior art went. It could be buried in a year, you know, 18 months of email somewhere. It's just a good place to list the prior that you know about um, so that it gets taken care of down the road. Um, and, and if you don't, that's actually a grounds for invalidating your patent. If you, if you know of prior art and don't disclose it, uh, especially if you did it knowingly. So that's definitely bad. But if you, know, if you accidentally did it, you, you, they're a little easier on you, but it can definitely cause you big problems. Um, and if you, if you ever want a form like this, just for your own purposes, shoot me an email. I have a kind of a generic form that you can have, no problem. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the harvesting side of, of the patent process. You know, from there, you know, if, if you're going forward with the patent, the, the, the typical starting point is, is a patent search of some sort. The general goal is you're trying to replicate what the USPTO is going to do. What are those examiners going to do when they, when they get your application? So first off, you know, the examiners are going to search the claims. And so that's what we're going to search. We have claims in mind. Maybe we don't have them drafted yet because you haven't started the actual drafting process, but we're at least bullet pointing out the invention, going to search, um, trying to, do, to figure out what the examiner is. First, first level, you're trying to do, figure out if the invention, if there's any knockout art, like art that's extremely on point to the point that it would knock out your, your application. That's, that's kind of rare. Usually inventors have enough understanding of what's in the prior art that they already know that, honestly. 
what it really does is it helps identify stuff that's kind of close, um, stuff that's maybe a competitor or could be a competitor, not quite exactly your invention, but it helps, it helps define what's out there. And, and knowing the, the con what the contours of the prior art are help you better, you draft a better application because then you, you're gonna use language and limitations in drawings, frankly, that will help identify or distinguish your invention from what's already out there, which then maximizes your chances of getting that through the patent office and, and remaining valid if it was ever uh, uh, litigated down the road. Um, and then I guess the final point on the search is, is you know, you know, inventors, savvy inventors who are really logically minded can do can get pretty far with the patent searching process. So I, def I definitely don't dissuade people from doing that. That's something they should definitely, I would always recommend doing some Google patent searching before you go engage an attorney or an agent to do this. But once you've done that and, and you feel like, oh yeah, I've done my searching and, and you know, I can't find anything. I, if, you, if, if the answer is you can't find anything, I, I, I usually say you're not doing it right. There's, you're missing something because it's 2021. It's, it's about everything is out. There's something out on everything. It seems like, right. It would be unlikely that there's nothing out there. And one thing that's important is this idea of class-based searching. Class-based searching is in the U S we use the CPC system, um, Europe uses other systems, um, but they're actually slowly harmonizing. And the reason it's important is the different people use different words to describe different things or the same thing. And keyword searching is good. And you can modulate that in a way to use alternative keywords to hopefully broaden your search. But especially when you're talking about patents that come in from overseas that are then you know translated, sometimes the translation is wonky. Uh, things like you know, there are some countries that call a mobile phone, for example, a handy, which you would never search that word in a U.S. patent application. Um, <clears throat> Class-based searching kind of overcomes that because the, the patent office actually categorizes patents ap applications as they come in into classes based on what's in the what's in the actual application. So it kind of helps overcome that keyword difference. Um, and so then it, once you identify those classes and there's gonna usually be multiple classes, then you go through and then there's subclasses and you go through and just kind of one by one, you're looking through relevant documents within those classes. And it just helps cast a broader net and a more, and it's kind of a broader and more focused net at the same time. But you do use keywords to, to get you there. Keywords are actually a good way to identify what classes you should be in because if you use keywords, you might run across a patent in the class you're talking about or, or re relevant to your invention. And then you can go use that code, that, that class code, and then go back and search the PTO for that class code and get a bunch of other related inventions that are related to the one that you turned up with a keyword. And almost invariably you find stuff that you did not turn up in your keyword search, which is kind of evidence keyword has holes in it. So, so the reality is yes, use keyword searching, but make sure you're doing class-based searching on top of that. And that class-based searching is the stuff that's a little harder to get at from, from someone who maybe isn't a patent practitioner. So um, you can play around with it though. The USPTO has free tools to do that. So it's definitely something that you, should, you should take a shot at. But ultimately, if you don't feel comfortable with your search, you know, you're know you gonna wanna reach out to a patent, patent practitioner to, to help you with that. All right, so <clears throat> assuming the patent search goes well and it comes back clean, as we say, then you're gonna go forward with, with the provisional application which is not a requirement, it's just, a, it's a tool that, that usually helps uh, save or at least delay costs. So, uh, you know, we throwing in a startup term is bootstrapping. You use it to boot, you can use it to bootstrap your IP strategy a little bit. Um, patent, provisional patents are usually cheaper to, to prepare. Um, the, the formalities uh, for, for provisional applications are, are just relaxed relative to non-provisional. So they're, it's cheaper for the attorney to prepare Usually, um, a, 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 a person with good writing skills can, can, even if they're not an attorney, can usually get pretty far with a provisional. So there's some probably some, you know, uh, sweat equity you can build into it. And if you're working with the right attorney, they'll often work with you in that way. Um, the drawings don't need to be formalized. You can use informal drawings that, you know, CAD drawings work really well for, for provisional applications. So there's a lot of little things you can do and kind of, uh, that let you carve down the price a little bit. And it just allows you to save some money on the front end. It provides a one-year placeholder. And that one year, then you're, you know, you may be looking for investment dollars, uh, 
revenue stream with the actual product for sale, all that. And so it just delays delay some expenses and push them down the road. Um, the other nice thing is you can you can file multiple provisionals. That's 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 one of the biggest benefits I think is so if you're iterating a little bit on your technology, you file a provisional and three months later you say, well, you know what, we have new stuff here. Um, well, you, that's okay. You can go file a new provisional and then you kind of sweep them all together when you file the non-provisional and then you, you, it's just easier to deal with than having do, done that in the non-provisional uh, regime. So that, that's benefits for the provisional in terms of like how you develop it and what, what content you put in this, the content's the same. You want, you want all of the, all the material that you are eventually going to claim in the non-provisional, you want to have that in the provisional. So that, so the, the, the threshold for what you put in it is kind of the same. It just doesn't have to be formalized in the same way. So, uh, okay. So you filed the provisional year goes by, um, what happens? You need, you need to then convert the, not the provisional to a non-provisional. Um, again, has that, that conversion has to happen within a year. It doesn't, it can, it can happen in one day. You, you don't have to wait a year. Um, but the way this operates is the non-provisional claims priority to the provisional, kind of like a daisy chain effect. Um, that's more formalized. The, these are the applications that if you go to Google patents and you're doing searching that these are what you're seeing. Um, much more le legalized or uh, much more legalese in it. Legalese usually costs more money. Um, one, one point to keep in mind is, is if you introduce new subject matter at the non-provisional stage, you, you may shift your effective filing date for certain claims um, because those claims are gonna be based on when the subject matter was in, introduced, but that's okay. I mean, you'd rather do that than not have it at all. So it's, but just be aware of that. You can't sweep in new subject matter after you filed a provisional and not have some repercussion to that. Uh, but, but that's something you manage. Um, and then one, one thing from a kind of cost management perspective to think about is you don't have to pay your filing fees at the time of filing. I mean, that could be a thousand bucks where you can, you can file your non-provisional and you, you, you don't file the fees and you get something called a notice of missing parts. Well, you have a couple months then before you have to pay those filing fees. And, you know, maybe that doesn't matter for most people. Um, but if you're a little bit unsure about whether or not you want to keep the non-provisional that I always suggest that because if you end up abandoning it at least then you didn't pay your filing fees and you save a little bit so little little subtle things that you can do there to, to keep things economical but okay so uh, I guess with that we've we've now filed the non-provisional we're, we're now at the examination stage so what happens when when the actual you know, the examiner gets your patent. So you file a patent application, goes to the USPTO, a lot of crazy things happen on the front end, um, but eventually that patent patent, ap or patent application goes to the examiner's desk, figuratively speaking. Um, the examiner gets it, picks it up probably in, you know, 12 to 18 months. And then when they get that, they, they start searching it. They, they, we're gonna talk about some of the requirements on the next slide, but they, they go through all the requirements of the patent statute, um, but, but the big thing they're doing is they're searching for prior art to see whether or not your uh, invention is new and, novel, and, new and uh, non obvious, which is why we want to do a patent search on the front end to try to mimic what the patent examiner is going to do. So we kind of predict their behavior. Ultimately, you know, they issue, you know, likely they'll issue some sort of rejection. I think their, their rejections issued in about 90% of patent applications that are filed. Um, some of them are, are significant in, in that they're hard to deal with, and some of them are just kind of wishy-washy. Unfortunately, the, the PTO or the USPTO is set up on a count system, so they're kind of always incentivized to issue at least one rejection. Um, so rejection comes out, then we get it, we examine it, we, or examine is a bad word, we review it, uh, analyze it, um, go through the prior art, see if the examiner's uh, arguments are on point or off point, in that response, we can make arguments, we can make amendments to the claim. So if the prior art that the examiner found is good, we might need to make an amendment to the claim to, to shrink down our scope or change the direction of our scope in order to avoid the prior art that's over here. So, you know, that's that's my Venn diagram in 3D space. So the, if, the, if the prior art is uh, ha, represents a Venn diagram, eventually we wanna make sure we have claims that are in a separate Venn diagram that doesn't overlap with the prior art. That's, that's a visual way of thinking about it. Um, so we can amend claims and we ultimately we file a response. It's somewhat formal. Uh, examiner will get that, they review it. They either agree with this or don't. If they agree with this, it goes to a 
notice of a lot, we get a notice of allowance. If they don't agree with this, this loop here just continues and it can kind of continue forever. They get our response. They, either, they can issue another rejection. We can issue another response. They can issue another rejection. It just goes back and forth. Now there are fees that you have to pay th throughout that process, but you can keep that going on forever or the lifetime of the patent anyway, or patent application. Um, but eventually there's a notice of allowance. Hopefully this gets issued. And once that's issued that you, there are some other things you can do. You can file continuations that claim priority to the, the original parent case. And we're not gonna get into those things or they're more nuanced, but ultimately you get, you get the patent that issues, you get an issued patent and, it, and along that a number and claims that you can then enforce. At that point, the patent is enforceable. Okay. So with that, what is what is the examiner? And I want to watch my time a little bit here. Um, what is what is the examiner um, really looking at? So th these are the sections of the law, and I shorthand I, I put the numbers in there. Don't worry about those. I use those for shorthand reference sometimes. 102, 103, 112, and 101. 102 is really is 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 any other other reference ever done what you've done what you're claiming, and that's what that's the one that I think most inventors have a really good handle on. They've searched some prior art. They know that nobody else is doing exactly what we're doing. Like that's a, that's kind of an easy checkbox. The the second one is 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 it non obvious? And that's a little harder. Um, and I'll I'll describe that standard in a second. But is is the invention obvious with respect to the prior art? That that's a it's a little grayer. Uh, one twelve here is really I call that kind of the patent application quality section. You know you have to make sure that your invention is enabled. Enabled is a term in the art. Um, there's support for your claims um, and your claims are definite. The, the biggest thing is probably enablement. Um, by that, I mean, you have to supply enough information in your application to enable someone of ordinary skill in the art to make and use your invention without undue burden. That's really what that means. And you know what that, how much that is, is, is a kind of a, a little bit of a gut check and just an experience thing from your lawyer. But it, you, you can't just, file claims and some drawings and hope it goes through. You've got to supply some technical content so that someone of ordinary skill in the art knows how to make and use your invention. Now, with things like mechanical devices and electronics, that's not as that's not as an issue because if you show a picture of a mechanical device, that's probably an, a good schematic. That's probably enough that, that that ordinary skill in the art person can can make and use it. Same thing with electronics. Where it becomes more problematic is in some software, you know, AI, this is like, one of the areas that comes up a lot, AI, machine learning, uh, some of the biotech spaces uh, also, genetics in particular. Um, anything that feels kind of like a black box where you're not really describing how it works, it's just a black box that does something magical. That's where you have an enablement problem. Um, and that's, you know, that's on your lawyer to make sure you, you we identify that before you file the application. It, if you don't, it can actually be, it can, it can be the death penalty. You can't, you just can't move your patent forward in the patent app, in the patent office. So that's important. Um, 101, I'm not gonna get into much here, but this is really the patent eligibility part. Um, it really comes up in software and biotech again. And it's really the question of whether or not the government allows people to have patents in this, in this space. It's not really analyzed, I mean, it analyzes your invention, but not, not in a prior art sense, but really is like, okay, I look at this invention, I'm an examiner, I look at the invention, is that something that people should actually be able to patent, you know, given standards, there's a lot of court standards have been issued. That's what that analysis is. And, and for software, it's a little squishy. They got the, the Supreme Court has a few different cases that they come out with and they're kind of, they're wonky. Um, so it's a little bit hard to identify, but there's a little bit of a gut check on that too. And, you know, that that's again, it's something you need to walk through with your attorney if you're working in this, in a software world. Okay. So quickly, and I need to get, get to trademarks and copyrights, uh, you know, the patentability standard, novelty, non-obviousness, I kind of described the novelty. Does, does one single do written document or, or online document, does it provide, does it explain what your invention is? Um, and also the, the public use and the offer for sale are also the bars. So those self bars that exist, those also apply to other parties. If somebody else used it in public or somebody else offered it for sale, that's also a barring, barring thing. Um, the non-obviousness piece is one I want to talk about a little bit just because I want people to understand that so that they have some expectation of what they can and can't patent. Um, again, you know, the question is, is the invention obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art? Um, 
there are a couple of different ways that happens. The typical way is the examiner will go and find multiple references. So if your invention has elements A, B, C, and D, and they find one reference that teaches A and B, and they find another reference, reference that teaches C and D, well, you've already come the novelty standard because you're, no single reference does all of your elements. But the obviousness section allows the examiner to reasonably combine multiple references if they can argue it would be obvious to someone of ordinary skill in the art to take reference two and combine it with reference one. That's the typical way you see obviousness. Um, more rarely, you might see a, a single reference obviousness rejection where they, they have one, one, one reference and they're just missing a little tiny piece. It's not all that important. And they say, well, it's not 102, but it would be obvious in light of that one single reference. So that's kind of how that works. Be aware of it. Um, so you're not overly um, optimistic when you see certain search results come out. Make sure you understand that there's this obvious threshold you have to worry about too. Okay, with that, I'm, I'm short of breath and I'm gonna quickly move over to trademarks, trying to get through all this. But um, I guess right now, this is a good time. If, if people have patent questions, this might be a good time to, to ask them. Jennifer, anything I didn't touch base on that you, you'd like to hear about? I have one quick question. Go ahead. So uh, I will take the personal example. In my lab, I uh, developed some cell lines and they, they are unique, uh, but we have published it already. And somebody keep writing me email from other countries, especially from Canada and say, well, we want to take your these cell lines and commercialize them. Uh, uh, are you okay with that? So, how does that work? I mean, can I do that, or it is illegal to do this? Or, and we, I have no public, I mean, a patent or anything. I didn't. Um, I, the only thing I have done is the publication, and publication is out. Right. So no, no patents. Um... So that's 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 almost more like more like a material like a material transfer agreement or it, it, that's a that's a contractual arrangement. There's okay. nothing that stops you from entering into those agreements. Um, but now, if they are going to commercialize that, then how that works? I mean, they are going to make money and then they will give me some money, or yeah. how does that work? Yeah, that would usually be how it work. It'd be a, li a licensing agreement or a royalty, where you get some percentage of of their revenue. And so that, that is a subtle point, and you definitely would want to talk to a lawyer on that because you got to think about the subject matter. You know, A, is the agreement enforceable? There, there are several kind of really detailed things, nuanced things in that fact pattern that you'd have to work through. But generally speaking, yeah, you can license that ability. You just have to make sure we have something that's licensable and it's not something that they could just go and take and do without any... any uh, so in, in that case, the Unisty... Uh, Material transfer agreement people uh, here. Yeah, that, that'd be who I would. That's who I would start talking to first. Yep, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. You covered what I was hoping we'd cover. So unless someone else has a has a question, we can move into trademarks. Okay, yeah, I, I just have one question. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. No, I'm a so I'm a grad student. And I've been helping design uh, a new instrument. Um, I was curious because I have presented results of the new instrument, but not necessarily in the mechanics that go into it. Is that a public disclosure? Um, so would that invalidate application for patent rights? I know we did our information disclosure, but I'm not sure exactly how far along we're yeah. in the patent process. Okay, so you're bringing up a little bit, but I think I got it. Basically, you, your grad student, you or were a grad student, um, you published some results, but you didn't actually publish the underlying details uh, of the invention. Is that roughly right? And, yep, and you submitted right. it. You've you submitted it in an IDF to the university, but you don't know where it's at. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you'd at least arguably be okay. So one interesting point that is kind of in the weeds on on the, the prior art part is. In order, or not the prior, but the, the 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 disclosure that you you provide needs to be uh, enabling, which is kind of a 
the world kind of collapses on itself there because I just mixed a couple of different standards. But uh, then the, the disclosure that is going to bar you needs to be enabling. So if you didn't in, supply enough information that it's enabling, it doesn't necessarily, it, it may not count as a public disclosure. Um, trying to think of any other way that it could be problematic. Um, it wouldn't be a public use. You're just disclosing your results. Uh, you, you, you wouldn't be an offer for sale, especially in a university setting. You're not, you're not selling any product. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I think it sounds, I, I, it, I, I feel optimistic that it probably, probably is okay. I, I, I didn't even include methods of, of what yeah. you were analysis, uh, doing analysis on. So mm -hmm. I was just curious about that. Thank you. Yep. All right. All right. So we move on to trademarks. These are going to have to be faster. <laughs> I, I can run late if that's okay, but I, I know other people maybe can't. So, um, yeah, so, go ahead and, and run late because we're recording. And for okay. those who have to duck out, they drop should... off. Yeah. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. So, trademarks, that's the, the next big category in IP law. Um, you know, what what is a trademark? A trademark, at a high level, everybody has a good feeling for this. It's your, it's the name of your company. It's your logo. It's your brand. Um, but more officially, a trademark is any word, phrase, symbol, logo, under design. Parenthetically, we have smells here, but actually colors, things, anything that helps identify or distinguish your, your goods um, or distinguish you as the source of goods compared to somebody else, right? So it's, it's, it's some branding mechanism, essentially, that tells the public, Hey, this item is sold by Acme Incorporated and not Johnson and Johnson. I mean, there are some really weird cases where, you know, uh, UPS has trademark protection on their brown color. You have UPS brown, John Deere green. Um, there, there are all sorts of weird cases like that. Um, so that's high level. So you know, obviously, generally, we're just talking about words of companies and logos and things like that. But you know, we can be more creative sometimes when, when, when uh, the facts require it. Um, so technically speaking, there's actually a trademark and a service mark. Uh, people in the law might actually talk about service marks, but they're the same thing as trademarks and laymen use them interchangeably and it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something to get worried about, even though you may see people talk about their service mark, don't think that that's something really different than the trademark that you may be working on. They're the same thing. Um, Okay, so examples, I already talked about some new or some uh, unique examples, but generally some examples of some words, obviously shoe companies, Amazon, Cheesecake Factory, you know, uh, symbols, Dallas Cowboys, I guess. I'm not a fan, but they're here. Um, one of my partners actually made this slide, so don't don't hate me for the big red N since I'm talking to the SDSU crowd. Um, Nike. And I like Under Armour more than Nike. So these are, you know, I am a Nebraska fan, though. I will admit that. But, uh, so symbols, obviously. Uh, catchphrases, you know, can you hear me now? I think that was a Verizon catchphrase. Um, don't leave home without it, which is the, gosh, who was that? I don't remember. American Express. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then where's the beef, which old old Wendy's um, ad. Um, and then any combination of those things, what, you know, if you have words that have design elements, those can be design, those can be uh, uh, trademarks as well. Now, you know, what does it actually give you? What do you, what do you get when you get a trademark? And, and for the most part, I'm going to, I didn't really uh, put a slide in there for this, but I'm, I'm going to be talking about federal trademark registration. Um, there is also state trademark registration and there is common law trademark protection. The general standards for actually getting the protection are about the same. So I don't often go into a lot of detail about that. Common law is really identified by the courts and it's usually after the fact. It's usually, you usually use that because you didn't get a federal mark registration. And, you know, back in the day, way back in the day before the Lanham Act, before we had a lot of federal marks, um, common law was more common, but now it's federal mark first and then you use the common law as kind of a backup. Uh, and then state mark, state trademark protection is even more uh, rare anymore because federal marks are just superior. But in some places, well, if you're if you're totally operating locally, you might get a state registration. Or if you can't get a federal mark uh, registration for some reason, you but your state standards are are lower, sometimes you will do that. 
Um, but they're not, they're not all that commonly used. They're, they're more used on, on the litigation side. So I don't want to focus on them too much. And the standards are generally the same. But what, you know, in terms of a federal mark or, or what, what does it actually mean? What do you get? So you get the ability to stop others from using the same mark or another mark that is similar in appearance, sound, meaning whatever, whether it's color, the sound, shape, um, all that. Um, such that you know, you're, you're basically anybody that has a competing mark that there would be a likelihood of confusion of in the eyes of your, in the eyes of customers. Okay. That, that is, that is who you're getting to stop. You can't stop in like everybody. So say your, say your, uh, your name is, I don't know, Acme, Acme Incorporated. You've trademarked Acme. You can, you can stop companies that are using Acme in a, in a, confusingly similar way, but there's an analysis to that. And we'll, we're going to talk about what that analysis is. It's not just anybody who uses Acme. And you'll notice this, you'll see companies, multiple companies have the same name. And you might ask yourself, how do they do that? Because they're surely are trademarking it. Well, they're trademarking in, in, they're in very different sectors. So there is no confusion between them. If I have Acme incorporated and I'm selling fish um, and then I have another Acme incorporated that is making rocket boosters, you're, there probably is no likelihood of confusion there. So that, that the, the, the USPTO views that as acceptable. Um, because again, this trademarks are a source identifier, um, not, not a reward to anybody who owns the mark. Okay, so, okay, so in terms of federal tra registration, how does that process work? All right, pretty simple. Start obviously with a mark selection. From there, we usually do a search. I'm not gonna go into the search. The search is much more simple than the patent search. Um, so step one is kind of, of given, uh, you know, obviously you have to have an application, you got to make an application and then you submit it, goes to examination, um, then registration. And then after it's registered, you have to maintain it uh, periodically, which basically is the government taking their cut periodically for you to, in order for you to keep it in place. Um, and then if you have a, 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 an issued mark or registered mark, you, you may have to enforce it. So in terms of an application, what does an application look like? Here's an example application of a company I actually work with. Uh, the mark uh, that they were, it's a word mark, meaning they're just trying to get the word ter or the, the, the terms there, quantified ag. Um, you have to supply a date of first use, um, which is in this case, January 15, 2016. Well, I say you have to, you don't actually have to, preferably you do, and I'll get to that in a sec. You, you supply a, a first date of use in commerce, then you supply a set of goods and services, which are saying what, basically, what are you using this mark for? You're selling what types of goods and services? And then you, you identify, the, and this is usually done kind of on the attorney side, is you're identifying what classes within the USPTO you're filing under. And, and the USPTO has a bunch of classes and about every good or service you can think of is characterized by one of these classes you know, and, or, more, or multiple classes. Um, in this case, they had a, a they, they were a, a software as a service company, or at least partially um, providing software as a service. Uh, and they, it, you can see that there are it kind of let overlaps with the multiple classes. And so we file in multiple classes that goes to the pat or the trademark office, and they eventually now analyze it. And I'm going to go through what use in commerce and all that stuff means. Um, so I said you had to have use in commerce, but you, again, you don't have to have it at filing. You have to have it eventually in order to get it registered. If not, your, your trademark application will sort of go into purgatory after it's been examined. But uh, use-based application, that, that means exactly what it sounds like. You've, used, you've actually used the mark in commerce. You've tied that mark to some goods and services, put them in play in terms of, the, in, in terms of commerce and in interstate commerce. Um, and that's what that means. And you have to supply evidence of that. Uh, and, and that's the way you really usually would like to file a, a trademark application if you have that. But you can file what's called an intent to use trademark application. Um, as long as you have a bona fide intention to actually use the mark. You can't do it as a squatter to just go file a bunch of trademarks to try to get people to pay you. That doesn't really work. Um, so it's an intent to use. Uh, Ultimately, you can't get it registered until you, you convert it into a use-based application by showing use down the road. You have to submit a specimen um, and an allegation of use. But the intent to use is really is actually a pretty valuable tool because it provides what's called constructive use, 
Um, and if you're a company that's just getting going and you really like this name and you're, you're going, you're, you want to go forward with it, it might be a good idea to lay down a trademark as an, on an intent to use basis. Cause that constructive use, which is basically the date of your trademark application can actually be used um, as priority against someone who comes in later and st- actually uses, even if they actually are using your constructive use can become, become superior to their actual use provided predates their actual use. Um, we had a case not too long ago we, that uh, went kind of into litigation over that exact fact pattern. And we were able to, to win because we had a patent or a trademark filing prior to their uh, constructive use. So um, or I'm sorry, I said that backwards. We had a constructive use prior to their uh, actual use. Basically they saw our trademark and then they started using, it was really clear they were copying our, our, our clients uh, uh, branding. Um, but but our constructive use was superior to theirs, and we were able to to uh, prevail. Um, so in, in terms of trademark uh, examination, what what really happens? Uh, three three major points that the trademark examiner or examining attorney is going to look look at. They're going to look at your proof of use in commerce, and again, they might not look at that until the end because you you can you can answer the other questions first, and and I and then at that point your your uh, your, your trademark application becomes a registrable but it can't be registered until you you get overcome that last hurdle but that's just a they, again you submit a specimen you you submit a date of an allegation of first use you you uh, uh and it has to be interstate or I'll, I'll actually talk about that in a sec, second so hold that um so that's a general point they look at the use they look at likelihood of confusion they look at the strengths of the mark uh these are all things that i'm actually going to cover in, in the, the coming slides here um, generally speaking, you get an office action is what they call it, or a rejection from the trademark office about, about six months. Um, well, you get their trade. If you file a trademark application, you usually get an office action within about three months of filing, which is really compared to the patent system is super fast. And then you have six months to respond. So as long as you respond within six months, you're fine. Um, then they'll examine your arguments, uh, a little, uh, quite a bit more simple than the, than the patent. Uh, uh, situation, which you can imagine by looking at that trademark application, you know, example, abstract version of it. Uh, trademark applications are quite a bit more simple, right? They're, they're about this long. Um, they're, you're not talking about technology details. You're just talking about goods and services you're operating in, classes you identify, and your dates of use. And then they're taking your mark and comparing it against other marks. Um, so it goes real, usually pretty quick. Uh, you get a couple chances at it. If you don't, then you usually have to appeal. You can't you can't recycle the process like you can in the patent case. But it tends not to be an issue because trademarks are easier to push through and more simple. And we usually have a much clearer view of whether or not they're going to be allowed eventually. So they, they usually go go through um, with a pretty high success rate. Uh, eventually, you get an allowance. At that point, after you have that allowance, your trademark, and this is different than patents. Patents don't do this. Um, patents do do this in other countries, but not in the U.S. But in, in trademarks, it goes to the state, this opposition stage, in which it, it gets published to third parties um, in the official gazette of the USPTO, which is technically public, but nobody even knows it exists, right? Uh, but if you're a big company, if you're a big company, or even a, a, a sophisticated me- medium-sized company, you usually are using some sort of service to kind of scrape these publications. So when these opposition public or published published for opposition uh things go out you have a software system is scraping those and you're identifying anything that potentially could be something that your company needs to oppose so even though nobody knows about this companies that care will find it um anyway it gives them a month to oppose your trademark and they can oppose it on a number of grounds the biggest being is a likelihood of confusion between your mark and their mark um that maybe the trademark examiner missed uh, so 30 days, if nothing gets opposed, then it goes to registration. Registration happens, and then you got a registered mark. And then at that point, renewal kicks in every five to 10 years. So that's a, the high-level process um, to define some terms. What does use in commerce really mean? Um, use is, is, you know, you're taking that good or that mark, and you're, and you're, you're associating it with, with the goods and services you're selling. I mean, go ahead and read that language. I don't need to read it for you. But that's generally what that language says. Um, now, I think the commerce part is where it's most important. Commerce, 
doesn't mean just putting it on your website. You actually have to tie it to some ac economic activity. You don't technically have to make sales, um, but you have to be trying to make sales. And because we're talking about federal mark, it has to be commerce is, is uh, regulatable by US Congress. The most common is interstate commerce, right? Selling from Nebraska to South Dakota, that would meet the threshold. Uh, foreign commerce would work as would uh, Native American commerce. Um, the most common is interstate, right? Uh, now, this is where a state mark might kick in. If you're just completely local and you're not crossing borders, which is almost rare in 2021, but it still happens, then you may not be eligible for federal mark protection. And then you, at that point, you're gonna look at state mark protection as a backup. Uh, but the use has to be bona fide. That, that is, you know, again, you, the website won't count, but that's not necessarily a lack of bona fide attempt. That's just, you know, you haven't got to the point yet. There are people, it used to be a thing where you would make a fake use where, oh, I'm gonna sell this widget to my aunt in South Dakota and I'm going to make up this bill of sale and mail it to her. And I'll have proof of that. And that'll be interstate commerce. That doesn't count. That's not bona fide commerce. It has to be real commerce, not, not, a, not a transaction that took place just to satisfy the trademark requirements. Okay. So that's, that's the use of commerce requirement. That's ultimately what you have to deal with in order to get the, the mark registered. Um, the strength of the mark is the next important piece. Uh, certain marks are more registrable than others. You know, even notwithstanding what other people have done, this is just purely independent of that and focused on what your mark is about. Now, on the top end, we have fanciful marks. On the bottom end, we have generic marks, and it's a spectrum. On the, on the bad end, the red end, those are generic terms. You know, if your company is called Tires Incorporated and you're selling tires, that's considered a generic mark. You cannot register that. And, you know, from a public policy perspective, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, the marks are supposed to be used to identify to consumers the source of certain goods and services. If you're using generic terms that are just used to describe the actual goods, then it's, how, how does a consumer know that those are goods from your company or another company if you have those, if, if you're solely using those, those terms? So, that's just a fairness thing and, and it's a it's a notice thing to uh the consumers taking up a notch is dis our descriptive terms uh the, the that's those are terms that are describing maybe maybe uh descriptive of the goods and services but not necessarily generic to the goods and services and so oh you know these are some examples international business machines is, is somewhat descriptive um, I would actually argue that's not as descriptive, but I think of IBM, it, the acronym more than I do international business machines. Um, but you think about it, you break down that term, I can kind of see the point, you know, business machines, obviously though business machines is descriptive. I mean, that's, that may be borderline generic international isn't generic, but international business machines, you're a company selling business machines internationally. I don't know that, that maybe, maybe is descriptive, not generic because it's, you don't have to use the term international to actually describe the good, but it is descriptive of the goods. Um, McDonald's is an example because it's a name. Um, it used to be, I mean, until uh, they got screwed over, but it used to be the name of actually the people involved. Um, and so anytime you have that type of situation, you know, Johnson tool repair or, or something like that, um, and a lot of local businesses do that. Uh, Paulson computer repair in Omaha. That is potentially going to be considered generic or uh, descriptive because it's, it's basically just describing my name and then the location that we're in. Um, now, descriptive marks, those are the ones that are most problematic. Most people avoid generic. Descriptive is where it becomes problematic. You can get that registered, but to do that, you have to show secondary meaning. Um, and there's a mechanism to do that within the patent office constructively by filing, putting it on a supplemental register. That's a sit on the supplemental register for five years. After it does that for five years, it's considered to be per se second have secondary meaning per se, and then you can amend it back onto the principal register. The principal register is the main the main place you would register a trademark. All the while it's on the supplemental, you still have certain advantages that you would you have uh, in terms of the pr principal register. So it's not really all that bad, but that's just something. If you're dealing with that type of mark, you're going to probably have to go through that process. Um, you can also supply it on based on an evidence-based uh, submission, 
what you're probably not going to do as a startup. This is more statistical data. You got to do polling, provide polling data that shows consumers identify that or associate that good with your name. That's a, that's a much higher burden, but it is faster. Larger companies with, with larger funds will do that. Uh, suggestive is a step up. Not, not at all um, um, a bad thing. A lot of marks are what I would call suggestive. And, and you, this is registrable. You don't have to provide extra information, but that's kind of the dividing line between what is registrable and what is, in, is suggestive and descriptive. Um, again, descriptive is registrable with extra steps. And then arbitrary are, are names that, you know, not, they're names that exist, they're words that exist, but they're not necessarily at all tied to the product. Apple, obviously Apple computers, Apple has nothing to do with computers. Um, Uber, uh, Nike, those are all words that exist in the English language um, that are tied to, to companies. Now, Fanciful is the best mark. Uh, Xerox and Kodak, which is funny because Xerox has almost turned into a generic term because it's been used so widely. So these terms are, are uh, flexible. They, they can actually evolve over time. And if Xerox, for example, doesn't defend those rights, they run the risk of that term being turned into a generic term um, because people will start to just associate it with the generic functions of that product or, or the, the product itself. So um, if this, this goes into a little bit of selecting your mark, uh, you know, I always tell people, you know, don't get in love with your mark, pick one, hopefully that's in the green. Um, what I tell, you know, when people are trying to pick things in the yellow and red, the yellow is okay. Uh, we can live with that. And, and you're, it's not given that it'll be descriptive. We can argue that point. So it, you maybe don't know for sure. You shouldn't assume it's descriptive. But a lot of people fall in love with, with names and they just, you know, when they say, well, why are you so in love with this name? And the answer is always, well, I just really like it. And, and I get that. But, but I, I really, you're going to really like a trademark that is very distinctive. It's going to go through the trademark office really quickly, save you money, provide more security. Um, and at the end of the day, trademarks are not, if you just looking at these names, none of these names are valuable because they started out as being really valuable names. When Nike started out, Nike, the word Nike had no value. It was just a name. Uber had no value. It was just a name. International business machines wasn't, didn't all of a sudden make that more valuable because of international business. It, it is the value, it is, it is the branding that efforts that took place by that company that created value in that name. So you could interchange some, you could have Uber computer company and Apple self-drive or uh, uh, shared car services. You can interchange those at, at the starting point of those companies and probably be in the same spot they are now. They are the ones that provided value to those names. So don't get in love with this perfect name because I need to have the word, uh, I need to have my last name in it or I need to have um, a keyword in the industry in it. Those are actually hard to distinguish because those names and, and from another perspective, as like SEO and Google searching, if you're using terms that are actually in the products, well, anytime someone else is looking for those products, they're going to come up with a lot of other competitors that also have those names attached to their to their uh, uh, their web pages and that. So, I mean, it's to me, it's it's more about finding those arbitrary, maybe fanciful names that are really where where the value's at. So that's kind of a diatribe on my end, but um, that. That's some lesson in, in pick, name picking and, uh, and how it maps to the, 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 the trademark process. Okay, last step in terms of the analysis is really likelihood of confusion. Um, now, what the trademark examiners are supposed to do is apply this, uh, uh, the DuPont factors, which is a, a case in, in, in uh, the courts that, that kind of laid all this out and, and it's a few decades old now, but there are 13, 13 uh, different um, uh, factors. They never go through all of them. As an attorney, I never go through all of them. But if they don't go through all of them, I always say they don't go through all of them. They didn't do their job. I always use it against them, but I don't actually analyze them either. They, they really focus on three main ones, and, and they're, they're below. The, the similarity of the mark, and this is, this is common sense, frankly. Similarity of the marks. Uh, the nature of the goods and services, and then the, the trade channels, where things are, how things are being bought and sold. So the first two are probably 80%, 85% of the analysis. The similarity of the marks is just, does, okay, I filed for Acme at the trademark office, trademark attorney goes and searches, and they found seven other cases of companies with the name Acme. 
Okay. So they found some marks that are very similar to mine. They're verbatim identical, right? They're, or they're identical. So that, that is problematic. Now, what if they found, I don't know, Acme laundry and mine's Acme lawns. Okay. They're not identical, but they're similar. They share some components. All right. The best place is they don't find anything that has includes my mark at all. Then you're going to kind of sail through. If you, if you run into a case where you have some overlap in the marks themselves, then they need to really look at what are the goods and services look like? Are the goods and services close and overlapping? Um, if they're close and overlapping, then you may have problems. Uh, if they're, if, if the goods and services are really separated, like I said earlier, I think, you know, a uh, fishing company and a rocket booster manufacturer, those are, those are so far apart that they can probably have identical names and the examiner will conclude that they're not like, there's no likelihood of confusion. And by that, again, when I say likelihood of confusion, a consumer looking at those two companies is not going to be confused. Okay. It, and, and more specifically, if the examiner allows this trademark application, it's on his desk to be registered. Is there a likelihood that consumers are going to be confused by that mark in light of the mark that already is out there and has been registered five years ago? So that's that's what we're at talking about. That wasn't completely clear. And so you obviously look at the, 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 the marks themselves. And then from there, you'll look at how close they are in terms of economic activity. And then finally, it kind of is a tiebreaker is, you know, how are the goods being bought and sold? If they're, you know, one of them is a rocket booster. Okay. I'm probably buying that. I, I'm a very sophisticated buyer. I'm probably a government entity um, or Elon Musk. And I'm going in inspecting those. I'm sending out engineers. We're buying those and we're hauling them on a train back to our facility. Right. If I'm buying fish online, I'm just going to, some web page and punching in some stuff and I'm getting frozen fish shipped to, you know, Omaha, Nebraska. There, there's like zero overlap in those channels. Right. And so that's another factor that goes into it. Consumers wouldn't be confused because nobody would accidentally who's buying fish online would accidentally go buy rocket boosters. Even if the names are the same, they would know that those things are different. So that that's kind of how that process and that, that analysis works. Um, finally, once it goes through, everything's good. Uh, you have to renew your mark. So every, kind of two, two renewal processes. The first is at the five-year mark. You have to do a renewal. I didn't put in all the section numbers and all that because it gets confusing. You have to renew it five years. Um, and then you have to, after that, you have to, year, you have to renew it every 10-year mark. Now, to do that, you have to show continued use. This is important. So if you stop using it like the seven-year mark and just stop using it, when you get to that 10-year mark, you may not be able to renew. So if you want to keep the mark, you need to continually keep, keep using that in commerce because when you renew it, you're going to have to submit another specimen, just like you did when you filed the application. Um, and then you're going to have to attest to the fact that you're still using it. Um, and if you haven't, if you've maybe dropped some goods and services, so maybe you've originally had four or five and you stop doing one, one or two of the things, you, those will have to be dropped from the registration. So it's kind of a constant maintenance thing that you're, you're always, you're always performing. Um, okay. And, and then one last little bit here you know, designators. This is something that people ask about all the time. You know, when am I supposed to put TM on it? When am I supposed to put circle R on it? Um, you know, TM, um, you don't have to use it, but I usually advise people to use it. You, that's something you use before before you get the, the registered protection. So if you're relying on state protection or you're not getting a registration or your, reg your federal registration is just pending and hasn't registered yet, you're entitled to use TM. You, you're the one who gets to decide whether or not you put TM on it. Um, and I, I recommend people do that because it puts third parties on notice. And, and if they're, they're put on notice, it's easier to establish that um, in, during litigation if you need to, because it helps, it helps uh, increase the damages expectation. Um, and it's harder for them to claim that they weren't aware that you were using it as a mark because you had a big TM right beside it. Um, okay. Did I, oh, I didn't have that up. I had that on my preview slide. Sorry about that. So here, here's the slide for the, for the TM1. And now here's a slide for the uh, uh, Circle R. Circle R, only use that when you have got a registered mark. Like not an allowed mark, not an application. It has to be registered. If you don't, you actually run the risk of, of getting that registration uh, revoked. So uh, always use that 
typically speaking, wait until you talk to an attorney and they'll give you a thumbs up in terms of using that. I've had a case where luckily I convinced the examiner it was an accident, but I had a case where we were submitting specimen material. So they filed the, the case as an intent to use. So they weren't using it yet. They did start using it. And we went to go file the, the specimen material that shows their use in commerce. So I, we were pulling stuff off of their website that showed them selling these things on their webpage. And they had their big, their mark, it was, had some name, Acme, with Acme right now, said Acme. And they had the circle R in the upper right-hand corner of the mark. And maybe it's not clear why that's a problem. Well, their mark hadn't registered yet. We were trying to get it registered. And the specimen I was going to give the examiner had circle R in it. And so that looks like my client was kind of fraudulently claiming that his mark was registered. And that was the only specimen we had. And the examiner actually found it himself. We had to submit it anyway. And I just said, well, uh, you know, it, it was a purely an accident. He didn't know the difference, um, you know, so they, and that was accurate. It, that wasn't, they weren't being fraudulent at all. Uh, but, it, but it just creates problems. So don't do that until you know, you've verified with your attorney that, that it's okay to put that up. But once you do get registered, it's important that you do put it up. That, that's, that, I wanna be clear too, that's a notice thing. You don't want to just stick with TM when you have a registration. Okay. Still winded. Um, getting closer. Uh, trade while we're on trademarks, any questions on those? No. Okay. Um, all right, final final uh, bullet point is copyrights. And this one's faster. This one's, you know, we start with the more complicated stuff and kind of get get ourselves into the easy stuff. Um, so th this is only a few, this is a handful of slides. So copyright protection. Um, again, we're protecting things like works of art, music, code, software code is a big one that has some overlap with patent protection potentially. Um, so again, what, what going back to what does it actually protect? It gives you an exclusive right into all these things. Okay, it's a, a it gives you the right to control reproduction, the preparation, derivative works, uh, distribution, public publicly performing it in the in case of music um, or movies, anything like that, or uh, plays, I guess. Uh, publicly display the work with, with like a work of art in a museum um, and sound recordings. Uh, all of these I think are pretty easy and straightforward. The one is the derivative work, which is the one that's a little subtle. So classic case for this is, um, this is like a law school example, is, uh, well, this isn't actually a law school example. This is a case I think that happened in Omaha and we didn't represent them, but another firm here did. And I, I thought it was kind of crappy, but this um, person, it was just, a, just, I think it was just a lady that made quilts. So she just made quilts for charity they took these things and sold them. I think it was like the Humane Society. And she, what she would do is she would take old t-shirts that had cats on them. And then she would put them in a quilt. Okay. I mean, like pictures or paintings of cats. And then she would sell it at auction, you know, like these, you know, fundraiser auctions and then and give all the money to the Humane Society. Well, somebody who owned the actual copyright on the picture of the copyright of the cat sued her. And I wouldn't have taken that case. I would just be like, no, you know. We, we can send them a nice letter, but they actually sued her <laughs> because at first glance, you think, well, that's not copyright infringement. That's a, that's a, that's a, um, her, her, she's selling a, a quilt. Well, they argued, and I'm not quite sure I agree with it, but they argued that it was a derivative work because they were arguing that collection of, of cats made a new authorship or created a new, uh, work of art. Um, and so they, they argue that they had rights under that under the derivative work. Now, I would my counter argument is it's not actually a work of art. It's it's nine individual works of art doesn't necessarily make it a new work of art. And you do have actually a right to uh, um, the first sale doctrine, which is if you buy something like a book, I can turn around and sell that book to somebody. I, I can sell that T-shirt to somebody. Those things, you're not precluded from doing that. But when you start combining it with other stuff, if I would take pages of a book, or maybe if I took one book and put it into a collection of books, maybe that's a, a derivative work. Where derivative works really come up are remixed audio, 
um, where people take bits in, of this uh, singer and bits of this singer and they jam them together and all the, all the kids are doing it now, I guess. But that, that's where derivative work comes in. And so just be aware of it. It could be an issue, potentially an issue in software. If you're taking bits of code and combining it with other stuff, it doesn't really work that easily, simply, but um, maybe there. That, but those are the general things you have a right to. So what happened with the quilt lawsuit though? Uh, you know, I think they got a, some bad press and they eventually, they eventually settled it, but she, she had to pay some money. And, and, you know, the reality is it's, for reasons I'm going to mention later, they were actually able to allege a pretty high damages uh, expectation, which really it didn't cost, you know, they, she probably sold it for a couple hundred bucks at auction, right. which really probably wasn't the market value. That was, it was a fundraising thing. And it was just a donation. Yeah. Um, so at least you would say, well, fine. She gets, she pays the amount that she got at auction. That's a way of valuing it. But they actually asked for quite a bit more because it was uh, it, it first, because of statutory damages, which I'll get into in a bit, but it, it was pathetic. And, you know, it, 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 I was embarrassed as an attorney on that day, but, and I'm sure the social media comments were really, really, really favorable to attorneys. Uh, so it, some, some, some category, uh, some characteristics for copyright. Um, again, we talked about what they protect, but it protects any original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That means a lot of things. It kind of sounds, it is what it sounds like, and it kind of has been interpreted really broadly. So, I mean, it obviously includes paper. You know, you write a book on paper, you know, a CD, um, a billboard, uh, a web page. I mean, if it's, if it's saved in data, in memory somewhere, they count that. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, recordings of uh, uh, audio, things like that. So it's hard to find an example that doesn't doesn't account doesn't count. Uh, one point is is copyright is automatic. As soon as you fix that in that tangible medium, it you have you have co copyright protection. Now, so registration is not required. It is recommended. I'm going to get into why in a little bit. Um, it, and I wouldn't necessarily go go crazy and register everything you produce, but I would always recommend you registering to kind of that core copyright and material that's really relevant to your business. Before we get to that, though, ownership, who, who, own, who owns the uh, copyrights? Generally speaking, authors own own the copyright. If you, if you, if you write it or make it, uh, you own it. Um, that right lasts for 70 years plus the lifetime of the author. Okay. So that's a long time, right? I think I probably reversed that equation, but it adds up to the same thing. Um, lifetime of the author plus 70 years is a better way to say it. Um, so it's like when my kids are about ready to die, that, that's, when, <laughs> that's when my rights run out. Um, unless, you're, unless you're the owner of the Mickey Mouse copyright and then they just get Congress to change the rules and then we extend it. And so uh, some of those Disney things are coming up and I, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some changes to the copyright statute because we're going to extend those rights longer, um, which has happened a couple times in history. Now, I say the authors own it. There are some exceptions uh, in a case of work for hire. So you hired an entity to go and write something for you. Uh, maybe it's copy on your website or maybe it's code for your, for some software you're developing. Um, those Those rights can be contractually transmitted to, to you or your company. Now, you make sure you have something in paper, on paper, like a, a clear contract. When you're talking about an independent contractor, some states are pretty picky about this. If you don't have that, it can become problematic and you may not, you as a company may not own the rights and your contractor might. So you always wanna have a contractor agreement in place. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the, the employer, they, your company will ought, should automatically own those rights that that an employer for copyrights that the employer may uh, uh, you know produced authorship for, provided that it was related to their employment. I mean, if I if I am employed by a company and I'm you know writing comic books and the company I work for makes cat food, they, they're not going to own my copyright of my material. It's in the context of employment. But again, while the, the state of the law is that you do own it, that's that's something you have to answer at litigation. If you just have an, in, in, in your employment agreement very clearly noting that they that your company owns those rights, it just takes care of it on the front end. It also sets expectations by the employees. So th those are, you know, gen make sure we understand how those rights flow um, before people start creating works of art. 
for works of authorship. Um, so to the to the copyright final final slide, and I don't have any summary slides or anything like that. It's just bang bang bang. Um, final point with registration and the copyright, which is a weird last slide to have, but it is what it is. Um, it's not required, and I don't recommend doing it for every little thing, but it does a couple things. So for the big stuff like your your code, your source code, um, it, your core source code. Uh, I would register it, um, you know, maybe some core writings, you know, depending on what your company is doing, uh, maybe pieces of artwork that are maybe related to your branding uh, that maybe would be protected to be a trademark, but can also be copied, but copyright protected because they, they're works of art themselves. You know, it gives you access to federal courts just automatically. Um, it, it's presumptively valid. Uh, it, it's also, it, it, it's presumptive, that it's presumed that you think that the infringer was put on notice. It's like constructive notice to the infringer. And the big one, and this, the, I'll give you an example of how this worked, uh, it, is you, you uh, can take advantage of statutory damages. And statutory damages are damages are just, what they sound like, it's, they're listed in the statute. Normally, in, in a damages related case, you have to prove up damages somehow, and you have to show that you lost profits or they gain profits. There's a, diff a bunch of different theories on how you count actual damages. Well, in the copyright statute, it provides for statutory damages. And they range from, I think, $750 to $30,000 per work. Okay. Example of this happened. Well, one example is the cat quilt that I talked about. That's one example. But one more well-known example was back in the, I don't know, when was it? In the late 90s, early 2000s, when people were getting sued by uh, for downloading music from Napster and all those different sites. There are several cases where, you know, grandson down in the basement downloads a thousand songs from Napster and grandma who owns the computer and all that is getting sued for millions of dollars. This is how that happened. There were not actually a million dollars of damages. If you figure one song is worth a couple bucks, which is what the app store values a song for, you know, maybe it's a couple thousand dollars of damages at most. Well, they were using this $30,000 per work. So for every single item or title that they had, they were alleging that there was $30,000 in statutory damages that they should be uh, given access to. And so they could trump up these huge amounts of, of damages on the complaint that they would use to sue someone. Well, then grandma gets this lawsuit for millions of dollars and you know she's scared out of her mind. That creates a lot of leverage on the front end of, of, a, of, a, of a lawsuit that you can then use for leverage to get really what you want is just to them to stop. So you're probably not using this and actually extracting that type of money from them. You're just, it's a, it's a tool to get, get them to stop uh, infringing your copyright. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's how that works. And so that's why I say register it. Um, and and I, I should have had this bullet point up here, but you have to register it before the infringement occurs for this to happen. Um, that, that's one, one subtle point. You don't, you don't have to do it before it's published. You can't, you actually can't. It has to be, um, or not published, sorry, uh, put down into a tangible medium, but you, you have to do it before infringement occurs. Otherwise that's kind of a submarine. You wait till somebody infringes your copyright, then you go pick what it is and then you register the ones that people are infringing just for the sake of extracting money. That you can't do. You can still sue them, but you don't get the statutory damage. You actually have to prove damages at that point. Uh, and the last point here, uh, the infringement analysis is really substantial similarity um, in a proof of copying. You look at two things, are they identical? Are they kind of close to identical? Are parts of them identical? That's, and, and those two things kind of go hand in hand. If, if you have something that's identical, there's kind of proof of, of copying at some level. Um, so that, that's how that works. And it, it gets squishy. There are some times where it's, if you're talking about characters in a movie or in a book where it, maybe it's not, quite doesn't feel like copying but maybe it maybe it does when you start comparing you know you go through transformers and gobots back when i was a kid you know weren't go were gobots just copying the storylines associated with transformers i would argue yes but you know and there are a lot lawsuits all the time about storylines and similar characters um and those are harder to prove than just straight verbatim copying but but they those those types of cases exist so that kind of sums it up with copyright, much more simple regime. Um, we've got two people left here, but uh, any questions on the on the copyright piece? No takers? Okay. 
Okay, with that, we are wrapping up. Um, we're 30 minutes over, but hopefully this will be a good resource for people. Um, so oh, I, it's not actually the last slide. I got, I got a question slide. We've already done questions, nobody has any questions. And then I have a picture of our building in, our, in my email and contact information. So um, obviously feel free to reach out um, anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. This was great, really comprehensive. And with the recording, I think it'll prove beneficial moving forward for a lot of people. Those good. I hope so. And I'm going to get a drink of water. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm parched now. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Um, we have questions. We will send them your way. All right. Sounds good. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.